At this time, we have 159 functioning temples, and more are under construction. We want to bring temples closer to the expanding membership of the church. So we are now pleased to announce plans to construct seven more temples. Late in Utah. And a major city yet to be determined in Russia. Abaddon <laughs> Diabolus. But the fact is there is no collusion and I call it the witch hunt. <laughs> this should never happen to another president. This is so bad for our country. So bad. Uh, you look at this whole uh, hoax. It's a, I call it the Russian witch hunt. I now add the word hoax. It's a very, very bad thing for our country. Pocahontas, they always want me to apologize for saying it. And I hereby... Oh no, I want to apologize, I'll use tonight. Pocahontas, I apologize to you. <laughs> to you, I apologize. To the, to the fake Pocahontas, I won't apologize. I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism. The Serial Mormon History Podcast. The July Nauvoo Municipal Court hearing had found that Joseph Smith should be free to go. Big surprise, right? He'd been arrested by Sheriffs Reynolds and Sheriff Wilson of Missouri and Illinois, respectively, and Joe's legal counsel, Cyrus Walker, drew up a writ of habeas corpus for the profit and filed a complaint against the warrants for arrest that were granted by the governors of Illinois and Missouri. So, you know, governors, you know, major justices in the state, Joe was throwing punches in the big leagues here. The court, however, in Nauvoo was chaired by justices who were all under Joe's control. It was a kangaroo court that never would have sent their prophet and mayor of the city out of Nauvoo to face the gallows in Jackson County, Missouri. At the most basic interpretation, the entire point of this court was to hear whether or not Joe was guilty of the crimes charged against him in Missouri. The court was crafted for the sole purpose of circumventing the judicial system in Missouri. The logic was that they would try Joseph Smith on the Missouri charges in their own court, find him not guilty, have him released on his writ of habeas corpus. Then when he got arrested again, which seemed inevitable at this point, and actually extradited to Missouri, he could make a case for double jeopardy because the Nauvoo court had already found him not guilty, thus undermining the federal court system. But if I'm going to go with, uh, you know, examples I've used in the previous episodes, if I kill John DeLynn while he's on a visit to Seattle and I get 12 of my podcaster friends together in a room to say that I'm not guilty or to say that he deserved it for whatever reason, that doesn't exactly undermine the judicial system. It's ignoring the judicial system, right? But that's what Joe was trying to do here. The Nauvoo court system had just enough legitimacy to be recognized by the state of Illinois, but at the end of the day, everybody knew that it was a sham court that would rubber stamp writs of habeas corpus for criminals in the city, especially the criminal prophet that was ahead of the city. Sheriff Reynolds was not pleased with the outcome. He sent a letter to the Times-Picayune out of New Orleans with his side of the story. He recounts capturing Joe and then, you know, being captured by Joe's posse and then getting into Nauvoo. And then he says this, and this is from the July 20th, 1843 number of the paper, quote, At Nauvoo, I was compelled by writ of habeas corpus in the nature of an attachment to give up the profit to the municipal court. I refused to recognize the jurisdiction of the court, and after going through a sham ex parte trial, the court discharged Joe on the insufficiency of the warrant, and also, as they allege, on the merits of the case. Be it known that Holy Joe is himself presiding judge of the very court by a quorum of which he was discharged. I then repaired to Governor Ford for aid to assist in capturing Joe, the Honorable Cyrus Walker still following to counteract my movements. The governor has taken the matter under advisement, and what the result will be I do not know." End quote. We'll get into how Governor Ford responded to this kangaroo court momentarily, but for now Joe was free. But the fight was long from over. 
The sheriffs were currently in Carthage, Illinois, trying to raise the local platoon of the Illinois state militia so that they could march into Nauvoo with force and arrest Joseph Smith to be extradited once and for all. Now, this option only had a small window of possible outcomes. You see, Governor Ford could grant them permission to take a division of the Illinois state militia. They could make it into Nauvoo with that little contingency of the militia, and then they'd be immediately run out of Nauvoo by the far superior Nauvoo Legion. Then, of course, the Mormons would be in open defiance of state laws again, just like it happened in Missouri, and then it would, you know, inevitably come down to a battle of some kind. Um, Alternately, the state militia could make it into Nauvoo and try to arrest Joseph Smith, but you know that he would have intel way ahead of them, then he would be hiding like he was for the last six months of, you know, 1842, and they would never find him in order to be able to arrest him. Even if they did catch him and put him under arrest, then what? How could a force of a few hundred militiamen get the commanding officer of an army of a few thousand armed men out of Nauvoo? I mean, that as well, it likely would have resulted in a battle at Nauvoo between the Illinois militia and the Mormon militia. Then what? Well, what about an alternate option? Let's forget all of that and suspend all constraints. Let's say this this contingency of the Illinois militia made it into Nauvoo, arrested Joseph Smith, then was able to make their way out of Nauvoo without firing a shot, which already there's so many qualifiers because it, it seems impossible to do. How far do you think they would get from the kingdom before a posse of Danites rode them down and rescued the prophet at all costs? Would they even get across the Mississippi? You see, this is how criminal empires work. Everybody trying to rein in the kingpin follows all of the rules, but the kingpin doesn't play by any set of rules and always has the advantage, as long as his army is loyal to him. But Governor Ford of Illinois was no idiot. He knew the ramifications of marching a state militia into Nauvoo. He would not grant permission at this time. But everybody involved didn't know that yet, and even Ford was probably torn with what to do in real time as this was all transpiring. So in order to claim legitimacy of the Nauvoo court findings, a folder was compiled with the writs of arrest and the complaint filed by Cyrus Walker that we read through last week, along with a few new affidavits from Joe's legal counselors and Joe himself. And all of that was sent to Governor Ford with hopes that he would see that the Nauvoo court was, you know, committed themselves in a proper way and he'd see it in a favorable light and then not call out the Illinois militia to march into Nauvoo to arrest Joseph Smith. On the other hand, we don't know what Sheriffs Wilson and Reynolds were telling the local militia in Carthage or what they were saying to Governor Ford in order to persuade him to call out the militia. You know, Governor Ford was like the plastic white matter network that was keeping the peace between the Mormons on one side and the officers of the law trying to serve the due process of the law on the other side. On the first day of the hearing... Joe had sent his close advisor and confidant, Stephen Markham, to follow the sheriffs to Carthage to find out what was going on. Markham returned late the next day with intel that the sheriffs intended to call out the militia, and it was decided to expedite the document collection process in order to send that all all the documentation of the court hearings to Governor Ford. The affidavit by Joe's legal counsel is interesting. This affidavit includes his chief lawyer, Cyrus Walker, along with Mr. Patrick Southwick and Wasson, who were all, you know, subsequent counselors as well to Joseph Smith. And they all made their affidavit that Joe had been cordial and abiding by the system of law the entire time that he was in the custody of the sheriffs. The affidavit was made after a large congregation of Mormons had gathered in the grove on the morning of Sunday, July 2nd, 1843. That's a day after the, the court proceeding, during which, quote, the counselor spoke on the stand stating that I, meaning Joseph Smith, had subjected myself to the law in every particular and had treated my persecutors and kidnappers with courtesy and kindness. They also spoke on the unlawful conduct of my enemies, end quote. Now, what they said in this public speech wasn't recorded anywhere that I can find, but we can assume it's probably largely similar to their affidavit, from which I briefly quote from pages 571 and 72 of the Vogel History of the Church, volume 5, quote, Your affiance, as well as others in the company at the same time of Joseph Smith's arrest, gave assurance and pledges to said Reynolds that his prisoner, the said Smith, should not escape from him. And the said Reynolds was satisfied, as he avowed, with the pledges aforesaid, and expressed himself to be so at the time, and fully consented that the said Smith might travel on said journey in the manner he did. 
that no violence was offered to said Reynolds or Wilson, and that to the best of these affiance knowledge and belief, no threats or intimidation were made use of to influence and control their conduct, either during the journey to or after their arrival at Nauvoo. Said Reynolds and Wilsons dined with Smith at his own house and were hospitably entertained. And after dinner, say in two hours after the arrival of said party in the said city, a writ of habeas corpus was issued by the municipal court of the said city of Nauvoo in favor of said Smith, which was served upon said Reynolds. That the said Smith did publicly declare in Nauvoo to the people there assembled that his honor was pledged that said Reynolds should be protected from violence and requested everyone to preserve his pledge inviolate. These affiants state further that no violence or threats to their knowledge or belief were made use of towards the said Reynolds or said Wilson, either before or after their arrival at Nauvoo. But the numbers who met and accompanied the said Smith and his escort on the journey conducted themselves in an orderly and peaceable manner and manifested only their attachment to said Smith and joy to find him safe in the custody of the laws of Illinois, end quote. Okay, so this was actually an important detail, and I kind of read a lot here, but let's kind of parse through it here. Joseph Smith had been responsible for riling up the Mormons to violence in the past, right? He'd given his grand speech in the Grove after his safe return to Nauvoo, telling the Mormons to let loose blood and thunder if ever they are persecuted again. He had a penchant for violent rhetoric and had capitalized on his arrest to excite the religious persecution narrative that he'd been cultivating with the Mormons for over a decade by this point. It was necessary that the record showed that Joe never called for explicit violence against these sheriffs. But that's kind of a tongue-in-cheek a little bit, isn't it? Because he may not have actually threatened them with arrest or with violence or with anything, but when the entire posse was there, that Joseph Smith was under the arrest of Sheriff Reynolds and Wilson, the entire posse of Joseph Smith's Danites and his Nauvoo Legion, they were there controlling the movements of Reynolds and Wilson— the implicit violence there, the threat, the looming threat that violence could result if they didn't follow the orders of the Danites, that may not have been stated explicitly, but it was still there. So the, the legal counsel for Joseph Smith saying that they do not know of any violence or threats or believe that any of those were made towards Wilson and, and Reynolds, the two sheriffs, that kind of ignores the implicit threat of just the Danites' presence as they were moving towards Nauvoo. But what is the alternative here, right? So Joseph Smith, you know, he gave this speech calling for bl to let loose blood and thunder, but what is the alternative to this situation? The simple fact that Joe had to tell the thousands of Mormons present in Nauvoo to not hurt the sheriffs while they're in town reveals that the, the Mormons there were likely in a state of mind where they would have harmed the sheriffs if Joe hadn't explicitly told them not to, right? And that's Rather notable to understand the general public tenor in which these sheriffs were brought into Nauvoo under Joe's control. There was always this looming implicit threat of violence. So all of these affidavits were compiled and they were sent to Governor Ford's office in Springfield to show that the whole Missouri situation was dealt with in the Nauvoo court and that Joe did not require extradition to Missouri for the case. Additionally, Joe was able to cobble together a petition to the governor requesting he not issue any more writs of arrest against Joseph Smith, which petition was signed by 150 Nauvoo citizens. Joe directed his counselors and assistants to get the packet hand-delivered to Governor Ford as soon as they possibly could, hopefully to beat the sheriffs, right? But <laughs> the Mormons had to stay ahead of any possible militia action that was raised by these sheriffs if they were successful in petitioning Governor Ford for a detachment of the Illinois State Militia. But we mustn't forget, right? <laughs> information traveled at the speed of a horse at this time. Right? I mean, during the Missouri-Mormon War in 1838, if we're going back five years into the timeline here, many events transpired as a result of limited information and people acting on that limited information. For example, Governor Lilburn Boggs signed the Mormon extermination order as a result of hearing that the Mormons had aggressively attacked Captain Bogart at Crooked River. Reports had come to Boggs that nearly every Missouri militiaman had been killed by the Mormons when only two guys had actually been shot. But when the bullets started flying, all of the Missouri militiamen at Crooked River scattered in all directions, each of them thinking that their platoon had been just been eradicated, had been slaughtered by the Mormons. Then each one of these guys went to the nearest town that they could find and then told the people of the battle that they had just survived, reporting dozens of casualties. 
it was inaccurate intel, but Boggs acted on that inaccurate intel by signing the Mormon extermination order. Had Boggs waited a few days for the proper intel to reach him, you know, it took that long because everything's traveling at the speed of a horse. He may not have acted so hastily, and the history of the Mormon-Missouri War conflict may look significantly different today. But the lack of immediate communication forced the Mormons and Joseph Smith to act quickly and deliberately. They didn't know if a militia was on its way to Nauvoo. They had no idea how Governor Ford would react to the events following Joe's arrest, and they chose to act defensively and quickly instead of being blindsided like it happened in Missouri with the Hans Mill massacre and the militias surrounding the twin Mormon cities when they, you know, surrendered. So Stephen Markham had the new intel that scared Joseph Smith. Quote, Colonel Markham returned from Carthage in the evening and reported that on his arriving at Carthage, he found that Reynolds and Wilson had filed their affidavits that he, meaning Markham, had with armed forces taken me out of their hands at the head of Elliston Grove and that they had also got up a petition which was signed by the inhabitants of Carthage and sent to Governor Ford by the hands of Reynolds and Wilson, requesting him to raise a posse comitatus and they would come to Nauvoo and take me. They were to start by the mail early this morning, and Markham requested Jacob Backenstos to go with the mail to Governor Ford and request him to suspend all proceedings until documents would be got to show the true state of the case, end quote. So when Jacob Backenstos was sent on this, you know, the, <laughs> this mission by Stephen Markham, he tried to accompany the mails. He tried to hire a local Carthage carri uh, carriage driver to take him to Springfield to meet with Governor Ford along with the mails. But the carriage rider was told by Sheriffs Reynolds and Wilson the intent of Backenstos, what, you know, what he was doing, what he wanted to hire the carriage driver to do, and that carriage driver refused to take him to Springfield. Instead, Backenstos was forced to go to another guy in town and hire just a horse to ride out behind the mails. You see, everything that was happening in Carthage at this time with the sheriffs there trying to raise the local militia, sending petitions to Governor Ford, filing complaints that they had that, that, that a posse of the Nauvoo Legion had forcibly removed Joseph Smith from their custody. Everything, all of, everything was reactionary. Everything the sheriffs did, that was all proactive to try and get Joe back into their custody. But everything the Mormons were doing in Carthage was simply to impede the progress of the sheriffs and the militia posse that they were calling for. So with Stephen Markham bringing back this intel and Jacob Backenstos on his mission to tell the governor to halt all action until they had all the information, Joe decided to take one proactive step. He called together uh, the, the 12 apostles in, to form a special council in order to spread the word that Joe was being persecuted again all throughout Illinois. The apostles called together all of the elders that they could gather to send them on this special mission to rally the Mormons and tell them of what had transpired in the previous week. You see, there were still a lot of people who'd probably received news reports that Joe had been arrested, but they weren't privy to the Nauvoo Municipal Court ruling that let Joe go free, or they weren't aware that an Illinois militia could be knocking on Nauvoo's doorstep any day now. So here's from the history of the church, quote, Elders Brigham Young, Orson Hyde, Harley P. Pratt, John Taylor, George A. Smith, Wilford Woodruff, and Willard Richards, this is the who's who of Mormon elites here, met at the Grove with the elders, and it was decided that the following elders go on a special mission to the following counties in the state of Illinois. Elijah Reed and Jesse Hancock, Adams and Pike, Simon Warner and Jeremiah Curtis, Calhoun and Jersey, John Murdoch, Vermillion, John L. Butler, Hamilton, etc., etc., etc. Altogether, it lists everybody that was headed out on these missions, 82 elders in total, going to 66 different locations all throughout Illinois to spread the word on what had happened. And of course, to tell the Mormon contingents in all these smaller towns to be ready should Illinois play out like Missouri had just five years prior. So they set out on their mission uh, in the, the very early evening of the 3rd of July, some of which is recounted in the history of the church. But the following day, July 4th, it was a big day. Now, the 4th of July was always a big celebration for the Mormons. They loved their patriotism, right? And fueling their patriotic spirit was the so-called persecution that their prophet had just suffered the week previous. Somewhere from ten to 15,000 people gathered at the grove near the temple to hear an oration by the prophet and his assistants. Food was served, drinks were had, a party ensued, and speeches were properly delivered to the hungry Mormons. 
Also, Joel told the people that a new petition was circulating, and he wished all the people there to sign it, calling for the governor to not arrest Joseph Smith or the Mormons ever again. Now, this was similar to the petition that was signed by 150 people two days prior, but this petition was instead signed by upwards of 900 people calling on the governor to stay his judicious hand. The new petition was expedited to Governor Ford the following day. So with all of this being said, I mean, let's let's zoom in on Springfield, you know, put yourself in Governor Ford's position. You have the governor of Missouri calling for one of your citizens to be arrested and extradited in order to face criminal charges, including conspiracy and treason against the union. Then you have the sheriffs who arrested this guy telling you that they need you to call out the state militia to bring this guy in. Then, on the other hand, you have petitions with over a thousand signatures, along with a packet of court proceedings that supposedly are clearing Joe's name from his own little fiefdom's court. And that of those petitions, of course, were urging you to not follow through with Governor Reynolds of Missouri's arrest and extradition warrants. So he's torn, right? What do you do? This was Governor Ford's response to this flood of petitions and affidavits landing on his desk. It's in the form of a letter that he sent to Joseph H. Reynolds, the sheriff from Missouri that was arresting Joseph Smith or had arrested Joseph Smith. My, my mistake. Quote, Executive Department, Springfield, July 6th, 1843. Joseph H. Reynolds, Esquire. Sir, I have received your petition for a detachment of Illinois militia to assist you in retaking Joseph Smith Jr., representing him to have escaped from your custody after having been arrested on a warrant granted for his apprehension. I have also received a remonstrance and some affidavits adverse to the prayer of your petition. I have also to inform you that I had heard before your arrival in the city of the escape of Smith and rumors that he had been rescued by a military force. Deeming these remarks of sufficient importance to justify me in doing so, I did on the fourth day of this present month dispatch a trusty and competent person as my agent to collect information of the various matters contained in your petition. And you will, I hope, at once see the propriety of all action being suspended on my part until I can receive the most authentic and unquestionable information as to the movements complained of. I am most respectfully your obedient servant, signed Thomas Ford. End quote. He did what a governor is supposed to do, take a back seat and wait until more information comes. But the question then is, was this the action that the situation warranted, or was there something more that he could or should have done? Look, Governor Ford's hands were kind of tied at this point, right? He didn't have any good options allowed within the system because Joe didn't operate by the dictates of the system that everybody else followed, right? The governor had to act within the parameters of his office and the laws of Illinois and the federal constitution. But Joe had a bad habit for breaking those systems. How do you stop flagrant abuses of the legal system while still using the legal system to stop said abuses? It's a conundrum, isn't it? The fact of the matter is that Governor Ford had a limited toolkit to work with. He had sending special agents and calling out the militia as his only two reasonable options, right? If the special agents couldn't get Joe extradited, if they couldn't collect the information that they needed, and, you know, in, uh, to be clear, the special agents that had arrested Joseph Smith in the first place, Sheriffs Reynolds and Wilson, they were special agents appointed by governors of their states, and they weren't successful in it. So the only remaining option was either indifference or radical escalation with military force. The escalation was a final resort, though, right? Like punishing somebody who double parks their car by blowing up the car, right? But the problem is Joe was double parking his T-90 tank here. Governor Ford didn't want a religious military conflict on his hands because he didn't want to look like Governor Boggs did at the time, right? He knew that the Nauvoo Legion was under his control, legally speaking, but that they would stop at nothing to defend their profit if, you know, militias, if combating militias, if it really came down to it. The system of law simply was not equipped to deal with a Nauvoo Joseph Smith. So Ford opted for the least resistant option of sending his own special agent to find out exactly what the hell was going on. Once he had solid intel, he could act with as much pragmatism as a state governor should. As stated by Governor Ford himself, he was much abused for his hands-off approach to Joseph Smith and the Mormons at this time, but he didn't have any options, right? 
The Mormons thought that Ford should treat the situation with more tolerance and latitude as his predecessor, Governor Carlin, had done. Non-Mormons thought that he was being too soft on the criminal empire of Nauvoo. <laughs> Governor Ford just didn't have any easy options. However, collecting more information and acting upon the new trustworthy intel, that's all well and good if this is the only thing going on. But the problem is here, Joe had many more irons in the fire to ensure his religious revolution. The blueprints had been drawn up. Talos was being constructed. The Mormon uprising seemed an inevitability in Joe's mind because it was the will of God. Each ally that he could make along his path would only strengthen his military and further ensure his success as the Yankee Muhammad, as popular media had labeled him. In view of scorching the earth and building his theocracy on the ruins, Joe actually had a very curious meeting, which was recounted by one of his close friends who attended the meeting, Wilford Woodruff, in his own journal. Before the details of the meeting between Joe and these gentlemen who called on him, let's take a little dive into a little bit of historical background to preface this meeting. Today I call attention to another anniversary, the 250th birthday of the very great Andrew Jackson. And he loved Tennessee, and so do I, to tell you that. On this day in 1767, Andrew Jackson was born on the backwood soil of the Carolinas. From poverty and obscurity, Jackson rose to glory and greatness, first as a military leader and then as the seventh president of the United States. He did it with courage, with grit, and with patriotic heart. And by the way, he was one of our great presidents. So, zooming way back, American expansionism was a controversial issue of the 1830s and 40s, right? So one of the primary reasons that Andrew Jackson was so highly revered and thus elected as a populist president was his violent hatred of and strategic dealings with Native Americans. Andrew Jackson had famously cobbled together Native tribes to war with other Native tribes who were resilient to American imperialism. And so when we say like the term racist, the, the, the word racist doesn't begin to describe the viciousness with which Jackson ruled American politics during his presidency. One of his campaign promises was to, quote unquote, civilize the native populations and remove those who didn't agree to be, quote unquote, civilized in the, you know, the European American sense. Right. So Jackson was elected in November of 1828. He took office in January of 29. And he gave his first State of the Union address on December 8th, 1829, from which I'm going to quote a pretty good chunk. But it, I feel like it uh, properly illustrates the mindset with which he was uh, ruling the country. Quote, the condition and ulterior destiny of the Indian tribes within the limits of some of our states have become objects of much interest and importance. It has long been the policy of government to introduce among them the arts of civilization in the hope of gradually reclaiming them from a wandering life. This policy has, however, been coupled with another wholly incompatible with its success. Professing a desire to civilize and settle them, we have at the same time lost no opportunity to purchase their lands and thrust them further into the wilderness." By this means, they have not only been kept in a wandering state, but have been led to look upon us as unjust and indifferent to their fate. Thus, though lavish in its expenditures upon the subject, government has constantly defeated its own policy, and the Indians in general, receding farther and farther to the west, have retained their savage habits. A portion, however, of the southern tribes, having mingled much with the whites and made some progress in the arts of civilized life, have lately attempted to erect an independent government within the limits of Georgia and Alabama. These states, claiming to be the only sovereigns within their territories, extended their laws over the Indians, which induced the latter to call upon the United States for protection. Under these circumstances, the question presented was whether the general government had a right to sustain those people in their pretensions. The Constitution declares that no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state— 
without the consent of its legislature. If the general government is not permitted to tolerate the erection of a Confederate state within the territory of one of the members of this union against her consent, much less could it allow for a foreign and independent government to establish itself there. So let me pause briefly. The entire issue that he's discussing here is native tribes banding together and forming their own government in the South, in Georgia. Um, he was not a big fan of that because there was the American government and any of the Native American tribes forming their own government, well, that stood in opposition to the idea of American expansionism. He continues a little bit further down in his speech here, State of the Union Address, 1829, quote, there is no constitutional, conventional, or legal provision which allows them less power over the Indians within their borders than is possessed by Maine or New York. Would the people of Maine permit the Penobscot tribe to erect an independent government within their state? And unless they did, would it not be the duty of the general government to support them in resisting such a measure? Would the people of New York permit each remnant of the six nations within her borders to declare itself an independent people under the protection of the United States? Could the Indians establish a separate republic on each of their reservations in Ohio? And if they were so disposed, would it be the duty of this government to protect them in the attempt? If the principle involved in this obvious answer to these questions is be abandoned, it will follow that the objects of this government are reversed and that it has become a part of its duty to aid in destroying the states which it was established to protect. Actuated by this view of the subject, I informed the Indians inhabiting parts of Georgia and Alabama that their attempt to establish an independent government would not be countenanced by the executive of the United States and advised them to emigrate beyond the Mississippi or submit to the laws of those states. End quote. It's just six months after this State of the Union address by Andrew Jackson, he signed the Indian Removal Act in order to break apart the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, Cherokee, Muscogee, and various other loosely confederated tribes in the southeastern United States, and thus forcing them to relocate. Jackson's successor, Martin Van Buren, was largely responsible for putting the Removal Act into effect after the major Seminole Wars had removed those tribes beginning in 1832. But well, then finally, beginning in 1836, that's when the Trail of Tears began, which sort of ran until about 1850. The Indian Removal Act, the Trail of Tears, and the larger idea of colonialism which created these actions is truly the darkest stain on American history. And, you know, possibly only taking second place to the African slave trade that was also contemporary with these events. These were atrocities committed by American citizens and the American government. A historian in 2004 cobbled together dozens of stories from the Trail of Tears and published them in a book titled Family Stories from the Trail of Tears. This book included old letters, family reflections, and secondhand accounts of what took place during the Trail of Tears. You'll find a link to it in the show notes, but I'm going to read a few small samplings from this book, and I'm going to forgo any commentary on it. I'm just going to let the people speak for themselves. Okay, here we go. Quote, Mary Cobb Agnew. My parents did not come to the territory on the Trail of Tears, but my grandparents on my mother's side did. I have heard them say that the United States government drove them out of Georgia. The Cherokees had protested to the bitter end. Finally, the Cherokees knew that they had to go someplace because the white men would kill their cattle and hogs and would even burn their houses in Georgia. The Cherokees came a group at a time until all got to the territory. They brought only a few things with them traveling by wagon train. Old men and women, sick men and women, would ride, but most of them walked, and the men in charge drove them like cattle, and many died en route, and many other Cherokees died in Tennessee, waiting to cross the Mississippi River. Dysentery broke out in their camp by the river, and many died, and many died on the journey, but my grandparents got through all right. I have heard my grandparents say that after they got out of the camp, and even before they left Georgia, many Cherokees were taken sick and later died. Herbert Worcester Hicks My father and mother came with the Cherokees from Georgia and Tennessee in 1838. My mother was a daughter of Reverend Samuel A. Worcester, one of the first missionaries to the Cherokees back in Georgia, and my father was a descendant of Charles Hicks, a Cherokee chief in the old Cherokee nation in Georgia. In 1835, after serving a term in the Georgia Penitentiary, because of his firm fidelity to the tribe, my grandfather, Reverend Worcester, was forced to leave Georgia. His notice to evacuate follows. 
and he receives formal notice, it becomes my duty to give you notice to evacuate the lot of land number 125 in the 14th district of the third section and to give the house now occupied by you to Colonel William Handon or whoever he may put forward to take possession of the same and that you may have ample time to prepare for the same. I will allow you until the 28th day of this month to do the same. Just taking their house and giving it to a colonel. Yep. For Mary Hill. Many years ago, my grandmother, Sally Farney, who was among those made, that made the trip to the West from Alabama, often told of the trip as follows. In every way, we were abundantly blessed in our everyday life in that old country. We had our hunting grounds and all the things that are dear to the heart of, or interest of an Indian. A council meeting was mostly composed of men, but there were times when every member of a town, Tula, was requested to attend the meetings. Many of the leaders, when unrest was felt in the homes, visited the different homes and gave encouragement to believe that Alabama was to be the permanent home of the Muskegee tribe, but many different rumors of a removal to the far west was often heard. The command for a removal came unexpectedly upon most of us. There was a time that we noticed that several overloaded wagons were passing our home, yet we did not grasp the meaning. <sighs> However, it was not long until we found out the reason. Wagons stopped at our home, and the men in charge commanded us to gather what few belongings could be crowded into the wagons. We were to be taken away and leave our homes never to return. This was just the beginning of much weeping and heartaches. We were taken to a crudely built stockade and joined others of our tribe. We were kept penned up until everything was ready before we started on the march. Even here, there was the awful silence that showed the heartaches and sorrow at being taken from the homes and even separation from loved ones. Taking people from their families, ripping them from their arms, throwing them in cages. Most of us had not foreseen such a move in this fashion or at this time. We were not prepared, but times became more horrible after the journey was begun. Many fell by the wayside, too faint with hunger or too weak to keep up with the rest. The aged, feeble, and sick were left to perish by the wayside. A crude bed was quickly prepared for these sick and weary people. Only a bowl of water was left within reach. Thus, they were left to suffer and die alone. The little children piteously cried day after day from weariness, hunger, and illness. Many of the men, women, and even the children were forced to walk. They were once happy children left without mother and father. Crying could not bring consolation to these children. The sick and the birds required attention, yet there was no time or no one was prepared. Death stalked at all hours, but there was no time for proper burying of ceremonies. My grandfather died on this trip. A hastily cut piece of cottonwood contained his body. The open ends were closed up, and this was placed along a creek. This was not the only time this manner of burying was held, nor the only way. Some of the dead were placed between logs, and quickly covered with shrubs. Some were shoved under the thickets, and some were not even buried, but left by the wayside. There were several men carrying reeds with eagle feathers attached to the end. These men continually circled around the wagon trains, or during the night around the camps. These men said the reeds with feathers had been treated by the medicine men. Their purpose was to encourage the Indians not to be heavy-hearted, nor to think of the homes that had been left. Some of the older women sang songs that meant, We are going to our homes and land. There is one who is above and ever watches over us. He will care for us. This song was to encourage the ever-downhearted Muskegees. Many a family was forced to abandon their few possessions and necessities when their horses died or were too weary to pull the heavy wagons any further. End quote. The Indian Removal Act that caused this trail of tears to happen, it authorized the American militia to relocate over 15,000 Native Americans west of the Mississippi. Of those 15,000 people, some estimates say that only half of them survived the trail of tears. What's even more concerning is that the Trail of Tears was just the boil-over point, okay? European colonialism was running at a constant rate throughout the entire settlement and expansion era of America, beginning in the early to mid-1600s. Native tribes were constantly being exterminated and relocated. Some would resist, others would confederate with other tribes during their resistance, but all of them were put down. 
Some of them would sign treaties, which were later violated by the government who had signed the treaties in the first place. Others were never even offered the option of signing treaties. This rolling boil that was a constant for roughly two centuries by the time Joseph Smith and the Mormons became a thing. But the Indian Removal Act and the resulting Trail of Tears was the boil over point that accelerated colonialism in America from that time forward. For the entire history of Mormonism, the Mormons always benefited from natives being removed from their native lands. When they were settling in Missouri beginning in the early 1830s, they were only able to afford that land because the government had seized those lands from natives and were selling it off for almost nothing. Similarly, Commerce, Illinois, which later became Nauvoo when the Mormons got the Nauvoo Charter rubber stamped through the state legislature, that was an area of diverse native settlements less than half a century before the Mormons put down roots there. The 20,000 acres of land that they had purchased in the Iowa Territory was highly disputed and it was known as the Half-Breed Tract, an area made possible for European-American settlement because of treaties the government had signed with natives and then later violated those same treaties by exterminating them. And beyond all of that, the Book of Mormon itself was written by Joseph Smith as a history of the Native Americans in order to Christianize the natives the way that many religions were doing contemporary with the Mormons. If the Book of Mormon actually accomplished its initial intent, the Native Americans who read it would convert to Christianity and would follow the prophet to overthrow the American government and build Zion, the New Jerusalem, on the American continent so the earth would be renewed and receive its paradisiacal glory. That is still a central article of faith of Mormonism. The first missionary effort was explicitly to proselytize to the Native Americans who'd recently been removed to a small town just outside of Jackson County, Missouri, where the mission was a complete and utter failure. From its inception, Mormonism has always benefited from American imperialism. So... Why then was this little history and culture check necessary? Why do we even need to talk about the plight of the Native Americans? Well, the meeting that Joe had that I used as a jump off point to discuss this subject was with some Potawatomi chiefs. This is recounted by Wilford Woodruff in his journal. And this is how the meeting transpired between Joseph Smith and these Potawatomi chiefs. Quote, on the second day of July, 1843, President Joseph Smith and several of the twelve met those chiefs in the courtroom with about 20 of the elders. The following is a synopsis of the conversation which took place as given by the interpreter. The Indian orator arose and asked the prophet if the men who were present were all his friends. Answer, yes. He then said, We as a people have long been distressed and oppressed. We have been driven from our lands many times. We have been wasted away by wars until there are but few of us left. The white man has hated us and shed our blood until it has appeared as though there would soon be no Indian left. We talked with the Great Spirit, and the Great Spirit has talked with us. We have asked the Great Spirit to save us and let us live. And the Great Spirit has told us that he had raised up a great prophet, chief, and friend who would do us great good and tell us what to do. And the Great Spirit has told us that you are the man, pointing to the prophet Joseph Smith. We have now come a great way to see you and hear your words and to have you to tell us what to do. Our horses have become poor traveling and we are hungry. We will now wait to hear your words. End quote. The Potawatomi were yet one more tribe who suffered as a result of the Indian Removal Act. They had their own trail of tears, known as the Potawatomi Trail of Death, that happened in 1838. This trail of death began in northern Indiana in an area known as Twin Lakes. It passed all the way down through Indiana on a southwestern route, straight through Illinois, crossing the Mississippi at Quincy, which is just a few miles from Nauvoo, through Missouri from east to west, passing through Independence, and then just over the border of the Mississippi uh, to Kansas in a little town called Osawatomi. There's just shy of a thousand Potawatomi natives that were exterminated, and official numbers list the death toll at over 40 people, which you can be sure is wildly understated if it was anything like the Trail of Tears that was happening the same year. So whenever we discuss how much the Mormons suffered during their extermination from Missouri to Illinois in late 1838 to early 1839, it's worth noting that at least they retained possession of some of their land that they could sell. They retained the majority of their personal effects, and most importantly, they were allowed to live. 
and to migrate to Illinois under their own power and authority. When we compare it to what was going on everywhere else in the country with native tribes being exterminated in the genocidal definition of the term, the Mormons got off pretty easy because they were white Christians, right? The natives were killed, exterminated, and brutally removed from their lands, resulting in genocide at the hands of frustrated white European Christian colonialists who wanted the natives to build houses with white picket fences and send their kids to Western cultured schools and convert to their du jour religion. When the natives refused to give up the culture and ritualism that they'd been living for thousands of years and the land that they'd been living on for just as long, or even if they did agree to become quote unquote civilized, they were killed or moved where Europeans weren't settling at that very moment, only to be removed or killed once again once the frontier expansion reached their next reservation. While we've ever only just mentioned the plight of the natives in this show during our timeline, we should always recognize that this is the background upon which our historical timeline is laid. The plight of the natives will factor more heavily into our timeline once we reach the Utah years. Just keep it in mind that this is the background. So with that all in mind, the question is, why would these chiefs be meeting with Joseph Smith. Now, if we go by Wilford Woodruff's reporting of what he remembered that the interpreter had said, I mean, you see how many margins of error I had to build into that sentence. The reason they were meeting with Joseph Smith was because their great spirit had led them to meet with a prophet who the great spirit had raised up who would help them and tell them what to do. Any time that Native Americans were reeling to reach out to a pale face for help, you know they truly had no other options. Just consider what these Native chiefs may have heard about Joseph Smith that led them to ask for this meeting, right? I mean, these Natives were living on the Native Reservation just across the Kansas state line from Jackson County, Missouri. Joseph Smith and the Mormons were the talk of everybody in Missouri, right? Because they were still feeling the effects of the Missouri Mormon War and Governor Boggs had just been, you know, almost assassinated. So what might these natives have heard about this crazy bastard in the far off land of Nauvoo, right? I mean, think about this. Joe had raised his own personal armies in multiple states. He had flaunted the laws of every state that he had ever lived, lived in. He had committed treason against the Constitution. He would gathered a diverse group of people and had successfully established an immigration effort that was funneling thousands more Europeans into his kingdom on the, the Mississippi. He had done all of these things while ignoring every system of law that he had ever fallen under, and yet he had never been killed by the government for his actions. Every time a native chief or group of chiefs had ever tried to do anything like what Joe was able to do, they'd been subjugated, massacred, and removed from their lands by the government. I, I shouldn't have to say it so obviously, but Joe was able to do all of that because he was a white Christian guy with friends in high places. The Potawatomi tried to resist the forged treaties of resettlement, but they were answered with violence by General Tipton of the Indiana Militia whose surprise attacked their settlement under the guise of negotiation discussions. Once the group had surrendered, General Tipton burned their settlement to the ground, destroyed their crops, and killed most of their livestock to ensure that the Potawatomi would never make any attempt to resettle in the area. I mean, it, just consider the disparity between the way that these two groups were treated here. The fact of the matter is, Native Americans couldn't do what Joe did because they were considered second-class citizens by the government and by the culture that was imposed upon them. They were here for thousands of years before the genocidal slave trader Columbus ever set sail. We must never forget that fact. What else could they do but seek the counsel of a white savior who hadn't been killed when he had done exactly what their friends and fellow chiefs had done and had been killed for it? Well. Here's Joseph Smith's response to them after understanding why they had called upon him for this meeting. And this is once again from the Journal of Wilford Woodruff. Quote, The Spirit of God rested upon the Lamanites, especially the orator. Joseph was much affected and shed tears. He arose and said unto them, I have heard your words. They are true. The Great Spirit has told you the truth. I am your friend and brother, and I wish to do you good. Your fathers were once a great people. They worshipped the great spirit. 
They were once a great people, really? You wonder what happened? You wonder what happened, huh? Joseph Smith with white skin? They worshipped the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit did them good. He was their friend, but they left the Great Spirit and would not hear his words or keep them. The Great Spirit left them, and they began to kill one another, and they have been poor and afflicted until now. Yeah, no, that's that's just an insane thing to say. They've been poor and afflicted until now, until the Europeans got there. That's the whole point. The Great Spirit has given me a book and told me that you will soon be blessed again. The Great Spirit will soon begin to talk with you and your children. This is the book which your fathers made. I wrote upon it, showing them the Book of Mormon. This tells me what you will have to do. I now want you to begin to pray to the Great Spirit. I want you to make peace with one another, and do not kill any more Indians. It is not good. Do not kill white men. It is not good. But ask the Great Spirit for what you want, and it will not be long before the Great Spirit will bless you, and you will cultivate the earth and build good houses like the white man. We will give you something to eat and to take home with you. When the prophet's words were interpreted to the chiefs, they all said it was good. The chief asked, how many moons would it be before the Great Spirit would bless them? He told them, not a great many. At the close of the interview, Joseph had an ox killed for them, and they were furnished with some more horses, and they went home satisfied and contented. End quote. That was the respite that Joe offered to these native chiefs. More of what they'd suffered for decades before Joe had his own city and army. More white European Christian colonialism. If they just stop killing each other and stop killing all of the white folk that were, you know, taking their lands, the Great Spirit would bless them. But every time they tried that, they were squashed without resistance. Every time they tried to resist European American expansionism, they were still squashed, but with resistance and scores of fallen warrior brothers. They could either accept their fate and make the marches demanded of them by the government, or they could resist and be killed and still make those same marches, only in smaller numbers, having watched their family members cut down with swords and bullets. At least Joe gave them some meat and fresh horses for their, you know, 650-mile journey back to the reservation in Kansas. That, and of course, a vacuous promise that their suffering would be over and the Great Spirit would bless them in, quote, not a great many moons, end quote. The fact of the matter is that the dynamics of Native and European-American relations had shifted significantly in the 13 years that Joe had been prophet. You know, he wrote his book in order to Christianize the Native Americans while Andrew Jackson was on the campaign trail, right, before he was even elected. 13 years and an Indian Removal Act later, and the Native American lands were becoming increasingly a thing of the distant past and distant location. You see, had Joe been granted this audience with Native American chiefs in the early 1830s, he may have been more readily equipped to try and forge an alliance with these Native tribes. But by 1843, the possibility of alliances with Native Americans was so far from his mind, making the initial intent of the Book of Mormon a mere fascination of his early ministry, long since abandoned in lieu of theocracy building with white Europeans. But Joe was smart enough to leave the door open to a possible collaboration in the future. You know, should the Potawatomi prove to be useful to him. The Great Spirit will bless you if you just pray. What's interesting is, you know, with all of this going on, with Joe meeting with these Native Americans, with, you know, <laughs> the fight that is going on in the legal system among, you know, the governors and the sheriffs, with everything that's happening, Joe actually had another iron in the fire that's worth mentioning. And this iron was starting to get to the near proper forging temperature. For examining this specific iron, we turn to the expose of Joseph H. Jackson of August of 1844. Now, as a quick recap, Joseph H. Jackson had joined the Mormons in order to gain Joe's favor so that he could expose the Mormon Empire. Joe had sent Joseph H. Jackson on a mission to Missouri to break Pistol Pack and Porter Rockwell out of prison and to finish off the Boggs job, a mission that Jackson had failed. Now, Jackson is beginning to figure heavily into our timeline, and he's been kind of an ancillary focus for the last five or so episodes. 
but a salacious detail in his expose pamphlet reveals some much deeper plans for properly arming Talos with some real empire-breaking firepower. But before reading that passage, here's a curious little line in the history of the church for July 4th, 1843. Quote, about 1 a.m., Messrs. Walker, Patrick, Southwick, Markham, and Lucian Woodworth started for Springfield, carrying with them affidavits, petition, and the doings of the municipal court. So that's cool, right? That was just to take all of the documents of the hearing that happened in the Nauvoo Municipal Court to Governor Ford. But here is the curious line. At a very early hour, people began to assemble at the Grove, and at 11 o'clock, near 13,000 persons had congregated and were addressed in a very able and appropriate manner by Elder Orson Hyde, who has recently been appointed on a mission to St. Petersburg, Russia, end quote. Russia? What's this about? Well, when I was a kid in the church in Utah... I remember that one of my neighbors was a traveling patriarch who made frequent trips to Russia in order to give patriarchal blessings. But I never thought about how much of a presence the church has had in Russia and in, you know, what the history of that, that, uh, you know, that stake is. It turns out the first Russian convert was baptized in 1895. All right, so our historical timeline is 1843 right now. The first Russian convert was baptized 1895. Orson Hyde never made this mission to St. Petersburg that he was appointed on for, you know, July 4th in this passage in the history of the church. It wasn't until 1989 that the church began an earnest missionary effort in Russia. And after lobbying for a few changes in law and becoming a nationally recognized religion uh, by, you know, the Russian government, you know, you have to be considered a, a, a recognized religion there. The Vyborg Congregation was established in February of 1990. Then Apostle Rusty Nelson, who is the prophet today, dedicated the first Russian stake in Moscow in June of 2011. Now, this proposes an interesting question. What would possibly interest Joseph Smith in Russia? What, what could be going on there that could possibly influence him to have any sort of interest in Russia and therefore call one of his most trusted apostles on this specific mission to go to Russia. I mean, Joe never did anything that wasn't out of self-interest, right? So how could his personal goals be served by a mission to Russia, which somehow were never revisited by the Brighamite church until more than half a century after his death? What happened here? Well, from page 30 of his August 1844 expose, Joseph H. Jackson tells us an interesting little detail that is, well, I think very illuminating considering that curious little passage out of the history of the church about Orson Hyde being appointed for this mission. This, the point in the expose, this is from page 30 of it, it's talking about Joe's campaign for president of the United States. So that kind of prefaces this, quote, the world is generally aware of the fact that Joe Smith was a candidate for the presidency. This has excited universal contempt and merriment, for no one conceived that Joe had any idea of his own success, but he had his even in this, which was more treasonable and deeper laid than a person unacquainted with him could imagine. His object was simply this. There was a Mr. Brown, formerly of Rushville, with whom I became acquainted in Nauvoo soon after my arrival there. This man has a wonderful genius for invention— and has planned a submarine, battery, and steam-fire ship, which, to all appearance, is capable of great execution. A submarine. A steam- and battery-powered submarine. He stated to me that he had been operating for 21 years in perfecting this work, but had not the means to bring the matter before the nation, and that Joe made him a proposition which had caused him to remove to Nauvoo. The proposition was to furnish the means to take him, together with G.A. Adams and... Orson Hyde, to Russia, where the invention would be laid before the emperor, and as Joe had great faith in its success, he expected a large sum for the secret, which Brown and Joe were to divide. This was palmed off on Brown, but was far from being Joe's real object. His real object, as he disclosed it to me, was this. He would first run for president, and thus be able to prove to the emperor of Russia his strength in the Union— he would then send George A. Adams and Orson Hyde and Brown to Russia, and after the utility of the invention had been fairly proved to the emperor, Joe's proposition to him would be submitted, which was to form a league for the overthrow of the powers that be. 
Now, this may seem too ridiculous for any man to imagine possible. Nevertheless, no one acquainted with the excessive vanity of Joe Smith will doubt but that he in reality believed that he could form even so preposterous a union. Joe's idea was that by the aid of Brown's invention, he could introduce himself to the emperor, and having the strongest faith in the efficiency of the new discovery as an instrument of warfare, he imagined that if his majesty could once see the wonderful work, that he would be willing even to take him as a partner in the benefits for the sake of its advantages. As wild as this scheme may seem, it is no wilder than many that have characterized Mormonism from its infancy. End quote. Aligning with the Emperor of Russia with a new invention of the submarine to overthrow, quote, the powers that be. Worth noting that the superior power at this time was Britain, and it was made superior because of its naval force. If you have steam and battery powered submarines, that could significantly undermine the power of the British Empire. That was the superpower in the 1840s. No collusion, right? Joe had escaped the legal system once again, right? If we're reviewing everything that's happened this episode, he had escaped the legal system. He had plenty of future plans to affect his religious revolution. Whether those plans were banding together with Native American tribes to fight for him or raising his, the numbers of his own personal army to be able to contend with the American militias or to align himself with the Russian emperor once he was elected POTUS to build steam-powered submarines to overthrow the powers that be, Joe had a lot of hot irons in the fire. He would proved himself untouchable by legal standards and practices, and his aspirations knew no bounds. Joseph Smith illustrates to us that the system is created to protect everybody when we all live under it, but certain people exist that the system is simply ill-equipped to deal with. Joe broke boundaries. He did things a different way than most people. He wouldn't be bound by the system of laws. I guess my conclusion is that everything that we've discussed in the past eight episodes really illustrates that his assassination in 1844 was years overdue and perfectly deserved. And that's going to do it for the main segment today. Don't go anywhere. Still got a couple of announcements. So if you are in the southern Utah area, I should say southwestern Utah area, there's a couple of events coming up. So first off, we have a presentation that I'm giving to a local meetup group in St. George, Utah. This is going to be at 175 West, 900 South in St. George, meeting at 2 p.m. That is on Sunday, April 14th. That is uh, the venue is known as Room at the Square in St. George. Um it's this is something that's organized by the local meetup group in St. George, a local ex Mormon meetup group, I should say, in St. George. If you're interested and able to come, it'd be really cool. Attendance is free as far as I'm aware. We're probably going to do a little bit of uh, talking before and after, maybe go out to uh, to dinner with people uh, after the actual presentation. But I'm going to be presenting a little bit on my Mormon story, my coming up to or my coming to skepticism moment. Uh, coming to optimism moment, I should say. And also I'm going to share a bit of my most recent research on the Smith entheogen theory. If that is something that interests you, early Mormon psychedelics, you're going to want to be there. And then once again, that's 175 West, 900 South in St. George on April 14th at 2 p.m. Room at the Square is what the, the venue is called. Also, Sunstone. Sunstone is coming up just two weeks after that, April 26th. We're uh, it's starting at 10 a.m. That is a Friday, but uh, the thing is, is this is the Short Creek Sunstone. This is in the Twin Cities that are known of um, fundamental LDS fame or infamy. I don't know how you want to call that, but it's going to be a three-day thing. There's the actual Sunstone that's going to be happening on Friday. That's on the 26th of April. Then Saturday and Sunday, there are other things going on in the town. 
It's a big yearly shindig get together with a whole bunch of people from diverse Mormon backgrounds, not just Brighamite LDS, but also significantly FLDS. Um, so what we're planning on doing is Colleen of the Mormon Happy Hour podcast and I are hoping to host kind of like a panel discussion while we are there and interview various people throughout the day, people who are presenting, people who are just attending, still getting the names and the exact people nailed down. But we're going to be in the same building that the actual Sunstone is being held. So once again, that is April 20th. 26th. If you're in the Southern Utah area or, you know, anywhere nearby, or if you want to make the trip to Southern Utah for either of these events, it'd be really cool to see you April 14th and April 26th, 2019. And with all of that, we have a couple of new patrons to thank. This is at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Looks like we have, um, we'll start with the easy one, C Baldwin. And then we have Darina Flinchy. <laughs> that must be one of those like Scandinavian names or something because that that is just – that's not a real world. But to the new patrons, thank you so much for pledging to support the show at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. And of course, patrons of the show get a whole bunch of extra content. You get an extra episode every week where we're reading through the history of the saints right now. We call that our Nemo Book Club. You also get extended editions of the show where I just sit and ramble into the microphone for a little while about whatever happens to be on my mind. In case you don't get enough of me every week already. And you know what? It's been a while since we've done this, but I'm going to thank our patrons who have joined in the NAMO Outer Darkness. This is people who pledge at the $5 an episode or more level. We have Preston, Judy, Chris and Christy, Jay, Frank, Kevin, Philip, Mindy, Karen, Shelley, Darth Mandy Pants, Sarah, Rodrigo, Andrea, Shane, Bear, George, Andrew... Eric, Dan, Lane, Derek, Stewart, Jared, Howard, David, James, and Doug. So to all of these patrons who are at our NAMO, Outer Darkness level or higher, thank you all for your support. You form the backbone that keeps this podcast running, keeps the lights on over here at Ground Known Studios, and it's thanks to you that I'm able to spend my day reading Mormon history and reporting it to you in hopefully a digestible and palpable fashion. And of course... If you don't have the money to support over at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism, it'd be great if you left an iTunes review or, you know, a review on your podcasting app of choice that really helps with visibility, helps spread the word, the good word, some might say it, the marvelous work and the wonder. Um, and of course, for all of those listeners out there, for everybody that hit the download button, everybody who's joined in to, uh, to tune along and, and uh, listen to the show, thank you so much for lending me your ear. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast. Cast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a aloststateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved.